Senate government operations. And today we're looking at um, some of the budgetary impacts on some of the areas that we, we cover. So we have uh, states, states attorneys and sheriff's office, uh, Department of Public Safety, Emergency Medical Services, uh, and the Academy, the Training Council and the Academy. And um, Nolan is with us and the um, w Commission on Women, the Vermont Commission on Women. Does anybody have a time constraint? Because we, we can go in any order here, but if somebody has a time constraint, um, we should honor that. So <clears throat> does anybody have one? Madam Chair, public safety has a time constraint for a uh, two o'clock with uh, Senate appropriations. Anybody else? All right, let's start with you then. Does that make sense? At your discretion, ma'am. No, I, th I think that makes sense. Um, so you would you like to um, have us, we have your, uh, budget information here you sent to us. Either you sent it or Megan did, but somebody did, thank you. So would you like, oh no, I'm looking at sheriffs. Um, Is that posted on our website? Well, we have the transport. I um, Did it get posted? It came in an email. Oh, I don't know. Did, did that come this morning? I didn't see it. We can resend it, uh, Madam Chair. If that's no, we got we got the sheriff's and dep and okay. that one, but I thought that Mike Sherling had sent us something also. I didn't send anything, Madam Chair. So I, I don't know what was re requested by uh, oh. staff to be sent in for this. So our our finance team may have sent you something. Okay. Well, maybe maybe I um, misremembered then. So let's just start with. I know that you um, talked about a new position. Do you want to start with the, the impact of the governor's um, uh, budget on you? And um, if you support that, well, of course you do because you're part of the administration, but explain to us some of it and where there might be uh, things that we might be able to um, help with or not. So if you'd like to start us off, Mike. Sure, uh, thank you. Most of the, uh, uh, the the budget restatement works from the original uh, governor's recommended FY21 budget, which we testified uh, before you on a couple of occasions, I believe mm -hmm. about. Um, so highlighting the areas uh, where there's an emphasis or focus on the restatement, um, and I'll ask uh, Megan to fill in additional details um, behind this, but uh, you'll see um, funding for a uh, co-director for fair and impartial policing. Uh, important to note that uh, that position does already exist. We have hired um, for that position and it's being uh, paid for uh, at the moment with vacancy savings. So this is uh, to, to backfill uh, and ensure we can keep the position going uh, under the current circumstances, uh, having a, an additional um, very well qualified um, civilian uh, advisor and community engagement specialist uh, on this topic, uh, we believe is uh, essential at the moment. That is a, a part time uh, position, which is budgeted at $65,000 uh, for this fiscal year. Uh, also, of note, um, we have uh, fully funded the computer aided dispatch and records management system, uh, although that's with special funds, um, but from for uh, your committee, which is operations, uh, there has been significant emphasis on the ability to collect and report data. Uh, it was part of our modernization strategy in January. It's something we also mentioned in our 10 point fair and impartial policing, uh, more nuanced strategy in, in June. Uh, that uh, is moving forward. Um, also fully funded is body cameras for the state police and other uh, both administration and legislative uh, priority for several years. Uh, the equipment is in and the installations have begun. We anticipate that installations will be complete by spring at the latest, uh, hopefully uh, quicker than that. Um, that is challenged a bit by the pandemic and the fact that the installation uh, team is actually coming from a higher 
uh, infection rate uh, state. So we've got some uh, nuanced uh, safety guidance that uh, has to go with uh, those installations. Um, we have uh, done a, a couple of different alterations uh, to the budget to um, modify um, the relationship of vacancy savings and, and overtime to meet the 3% reduction, but we don't anticipate any significant operational uh, impacts to that. We've learned quite a bit relative uh, to um, creative operations in the, in the wake, actually it's not even the wake, we're sort of right in midstream of, uh, of the pandemic. So some of that experience has uh, assisted in making operational modifications to help us achieve some of those goals. Um, we are also uh, working diligently to collapse uh, space, um, our physical space, uh, in particular rented space into owned space. Uh, again, the experience uh, of the last six months has uh, shown us how much of our work can be done um, remotely. And the Division of Fire Safety uh, is facing a, a budget um, shortfall that results in large part as a uh, result of the uh, curtailment of um, permits in the wake of, uh, of COVID. So uh, they're one of the organizations, or they're the primary organization that's looking at uh, space. And again, this goes to our modernization strategy as well. It's just accelerating a strategy we talked to you about in January, which is to really view our facilities not as individual department facilities, whether they're a state police barracks or a, a fire safety office or an emergency management office, but as you know, statewide public safety assets and how do we best use those assets uh, and, and collapse our operations together, both to provide better service and one-stop shopping for uh, consumers, but also to save the taxpayers um, a little bit of money and upkeep on uh, running multiple facilities. So those are the high level uh, components that you'll see. And uh, I'll, if it, uh, works for you, Madam Chair. I'll pivot to Megan to uh, walk through some of the other pieces of the, uh, the crosswalk for the restated budget. Before we go to Megan, can I just ask a question about, I know that when we do, I, I assume that it's the same thing for you, that um, the rental is considered an internal service budget. Is that what, it, that, that term? And um, <clears throat> I think that people are, are, um, that buildings and general services, um, but um, <laughs> so I know where you're going, Madam Chair. Yeah, some yeah. Are so how does if you're funds yeah, and and so some are if, not. You're, if you're putting them together, how is that going to impact if BGS is billing Department of you and then they're billing Fire and Safety and are are, Great are they involved in this in this? They are involved in their space assessments. It should not adversely impact the internal service funds. So not adversely impact uh, other um, you know, budgetary components in particular BGS. And that's because the pieces that we're looking at collapsing are external rentals, not uh -huh. state owned facilities. Um, we're actually moving to the state owned facilities to, uh, to continue uh, the fee for, fee for space and the internal service fund transfers. Oh, okay. Okay. And we just, sense. just so folks listening are aware, we, you know, we are, we do, we are mindful of any potential impacts to uh, landlords and communities. And we're, we're careful not to be making decisions that are going to, uh, you know, adversely impacting, impact businesses around us or communities. These are relatively small footprint offices of, um, you know, six, seven, eight, 12 people. They're not large footprint uh, facilities. Does anybody have any questions for the commissioner? And then we'll move to Megan for more, for some details. Oh, Anthony. Hi, I honestly don't know if this is a budget question or not, but let, I think seem to remember last time we spoke, we talked about how traffic stop data was not was reported differently in different areas of the state, different codes and whatnot. And then it took a person back at the main office to like, recode everything. So I'm wondering whether that's still happening, whether there's been any progress made in trying to get the traffic stop data to be coded the similarly ways in similar ways around the state. Does that make any sense? Is that, is that our conversation? 
It does. That computer aided dispatch and records management system that I mentioned a moment, moment ago, Senator, is that project that okay. not only for traffic stops, but for all uh, all contacts, all events uh, that are responded to statewide. The goal is to have a unified system, unified reporting, uh, ease of data entry, ease of getting the data back out, whether it's an interactive dashboard that any community member or anyone can use to see that easily or reporting out raw data that researchers or anyone else can pull out. Uh, and be able to manipulate in uh, in different ways to do research on. So we're making some progress there. We are making progress. Thank you. Okay. And, and may I just tag on to that, um, Michael? Uh, you're hoping to make progress. Do you have a timeline for that? Yes, we're uh, we're about to go to independent review on the selected <laughs> vendor. Uh, and as soon as that happens and uh, our file is complete, we'll begin negotiations with uh, that vendor uh, simultaneous to the independent review. We expect that will take uh, six to eight weeks roughly, uh, and then we'll be ready to actually start uh, a deployment. I mean, actually make it operational. Yes, it'll take a little while to make it operational because we'll have some programming needs and things, and it, it is all subject to successful negotiation with uh, with a vendor. But uh, but yes, uh, we're we're on our way. Great. So you're so you're hoping to have it working and up and running in sort of late fall. Or uh, early it will. It'll likely take into 2021 before it is, uh, we have a full installation. And then we've got, you know, assuming that our vision of bringing um, the majority of public safety organizations onto that system, that will take quite a while to, to transition and do system conversions and bring everybody on. But, uh, but 2021 is the target. Great. Terrific. Can you can you talk just a little bit about the co-director for FIP? Yeah. Did you say that the person was already hired? Yes. Yes. I think you know uh, Aton, who chairs the RDAP and yeah. FIP committees. Uh, Aton was uh, our unanimous and, and relatively easy selection, uh, and he was willing to take on uh, this work. So um, a known commodity with a tremendous amount of talent um, and uh, and someone who, who candidly will uh, really hold uh, all of our feet uh, to the fire on looking forward and mm -hmm. making changes. Good, good. I'm anxious to um, have him talk to us about that. That'll be good. We're also fortunate, I should mention, uh, Captain Julie Scribner is gonna be moving into the other co-director position as uh, Captain Gary Scott retires in November. So. Uh, also very fortunate to have, uh, you know, Gary's done a tremendous job yeah. uh, over the last few years and uh, uh, Julie is going to be uh, a great addition um, to that as well. You actually let people retire? Well, I'm trying. I, 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 it's possible, it's conceivable I could have a draft piece of legislation that uh, for you to consider about not letting him retire, but he may be angry about that. We could put that in the budget. But uh, uh, oh, because he's a VSP person, and he has to retire at fifty-five. I actually don't 55? know what's what's driving uh, whether it's time in service or uh, or or age, um, uh, which uh, which I can version answer that, that if you want. Go I'm sure you want to out him. <laughs> <laughs> you gonna out him uh, without telling you his age. Uh, it is time and service and age, which is our retirement system, yeah. 20 years and 50. Mm -hmm. They're eligible wow. to retire. Mandatory right. retirement is 55. Yes, it's way young. Yeah, well, we, it is very, some very of young. us would like to change that, but yeah. Just keep in mind that it's not the years that will get you in this job, it's the mileage. Uh, that could be said for many jobs. That's true. So, um, Megan, would you like to, is there anything you'd like to fill us in on or some more details on the budget and the, um, uh, Madam Chair, this is uh, yes. Rick Allenbeck for the record, oh, uh, Director of Finance and Administration and Public Safety. Um, I'll take those uh, budget questions. I actually did just forward to you our FY21 restated budget proposal. Um, and as well, I know uh, Chrissy Galuli has posted it 
on the Senate Appropriations uh, Committee site. I'm not sure if you're able to access it there. Um, I could share my screen if you want to see a copy of the ups and downs form. Rick, uh, just briefly, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, I skipped over a giant piece, uh, which is the mental health uh, outreach specialists. Oh. Um, so just very briefly, uh, it was um, you know, widely accepted as a, um, a good strategy. Historically, in January, we put forth this, again, as part of our modernization strategy to expand from two barracks to as many as possible. In S-219, the legislature asked us to propose a plan for expansion of this program uh, statewide. Uh, we did that in July, um, planning for two this year, uh, an expansion of two additional this year to the following year and to the, the out year. Um, and that uh, was reprioritized in the governor's restated budget to accelerate that and add seven additional positions in this year's budget. So um, that's another area. And I apologize, Rick, for A, uh, not knowing that you were on and B, for uh, interrupting your flow there. So, and, but, but also, we haven't gotten anything. I mean, not an email. We're, we're yeah, we did. To... We just got it in email. I I haven't gotten it, but it takes a long time to get to Windsor County. It's true. I, it... I know. You you're way out there in the sticks. So if you put seven additional um, positions in, does that cover all the barracks? We will be well, both one short in the barracks, but also uh, of note is that the state currently does not pay for the other two. They're done through um, MOUs with designated agencies. So in order to assure uh, parity, we have to come up with a plan really to fund three additional positions so that uh -huh. the, those designated agencies are, aren't disadvantaged by this expansion. So we're working on that. Oh, yeah, good. All right. Well, so any more questions for the commissioner? Well, I'd just like to know what the total DPS budget is. Rick can give you I that think, to the penny. I think it's right there on our email. I know, but I haven't gotten that email yet. Oh. Uh, to clarify, uh, Senator White, I, I did send that to you directly. Um, yeah. I don't I, have everyone's email I, address, unfortunately. Oh. It just Senate economic, I mean, not Senate government operations, and that gets to all of us. Okay. Well, to Mike Ferrand, send it to Mike Ferrand. And then we can post it and we can all look at it. And is uh, that, can you spell Ferrand? M. Ferrant. F-E-R-R-A-N-T. And it's at ledge.state.bt. And Mike, you can post it for us. I can. I just um, I just sent him my email address too. Okay. Okay. You should have that shortly. And I will um, get back to your question. The total public safety um, budget the governor recommend for the FY21 restate. In general funds, it's uh, 54,330,972. And the all funds total is 113,795,517. Thank you. And uh, um, Mr. Okay. Farron, did you receive my email with the budget proposal? I did, and I am posting it to the committee's website right now. It takes a few minutes to stick there, but it should be there in two minutes. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, are you intending okay. that I go through our ups and downs form once you have that posted on your website, or do you... Well, I think just kind of a high level, and then um, if committee members have questions about it, I think our our um, the appropriate. We don't want you to have to go through this whole thing twice, um, and you're going to have to go through it in detail with the appropriations committee. We just want to kind of get an overview, and some of the things that we were really concerned about, I know, were the body cams and the mental health specialists, and then um, the. Very interesting to hear about the co-director for FIP 
and so those are the kinds of things that um, unless committee members have very specific questions right now, I would say a high level. And then um, if there are issues that we need to address or, um, and I know that <clears throat> it's hard to ask the you to um, say anything about the budget because you're part of the administration, but if there are issues, let us know. Great. And I would just add to our chair's comments that we are your advocates in appropriations as well as you know, as well as obviously your good work in appropriations, but we can advocate and have advocated quite successfully for the things that we consider most important. Yeah. Yeah, just to speak to that for a moment, Madam Chair, uh, the, the budget itself that, you know, we're very supportive of the budget, um, not just because we're an, uh, an extension of uh, the administration, but um, you'll recall that the original statement of the FY21 budget is a uh, represents the first year of a multi-year strategy mm -hmm. to uh, do additional investments to stabilize our budget. So, with that as the starting point, and now the the you know the pullback of roughly three percent um, necessitated by the pandemic um, still puts us in uh, not a not a perfect position, but uh, you know as stable I think as we've. We've been, and we still have that multi-year plan. Once things are uh, are are more, uh, once we get past the COVID pandemic, um, you know, I think we've got a good plan moving forward that uh, either this administration or a future administration, uh, together with the General Assembly, can use as a template to move forward. Okay. Madam Thank you. Chair, yes, um, this is Mike Front. The uh, budget document is on the committee's website. Um, we can share it on screen here if you would like, or if you'd just like to direct the public back to that, whichever is easier for you. Whatever you think is easier, committee members, do you want to just um, put it up on your screens or do you want it to be shared on the screen here? Committee? Uh, I, I think it's it's fine for us to look at it on our own. And I mean, uh, if is we're going to do a high level, we may not need to see yeah. every detail. Does everybody have access to something that they can look at well? Yep. Yeah. Brian? Anthony? Okay, great. Let's just do it that way then. I don't think you have to share on the screen. So we have, it's here and um, I'm looking at it. Yeah. Okay. So the commissioner has uh, gone over all of the items that are in the state police appropriation fairly well. Um, I can direct your attention to appropriation number two, criminal justice services. Mm -hmm. The first two lines are simply internal service fee reductions um, from uh, BGS. So those are, didn't really uh, cause any pressures for us. The travel and registration under COVID, we're not really seeing a lot of travel and training happening for obvious reasons. So that is a an easy way to reduce some of our our budget to, to meet the target uh, and then a small amount in vacancy savings. So pretty small cuts overall for the criminal justice services appropriation. And can you remind us what is included in criminal justice services? Sure, the Vermont Crime Information Center mm -hmm. uh, and the Radio Technology Services Division. Um, VCIC okay. stands, yeah, Vermont Crime Information yep. Center. I think I said that. Okay, thank you. Um, so if there's no questions about that, I can move on to emergency management. Yep. Um, the uh, small workers comp reduction is an internal service fee. Um, in emergency management, you have a little bit of movement here because we were intending to have uh, a 1.5 FTE move from federal to general as part of a long-term strategy to get um, an appropriate amount of match for our federal funds uh, and the fact that the federal funds are somewhat stagnant over time. However, due to some of the COVID funding that was available, we were able to delay that. And in, in return, um, beyond the savings, we were able to put back, um, put some, um, money towards our swift water rescue and damage assessments. And these are really important for um, flood events and disaster events. 
because the federal funds does a great job of paying for the um, outfitting and training for a swift water team, but they won't pay for response. Um, and the damage assessments are very important to get um, the uh, local emergency planning commissions involved uh, early on in getting a good damage assessment that can affect whether or not we have a declaration and receive federal funds under public okay. assistance. Those are two um, very important things that we're able to add into our FY21 restate. Okay. Any questions about that? Chris? Yeah, and actually it's on a prior section, so I'll wait till we're done with this section. Oh, okay. I think, I think he's done with um, number three. Okay, I had a quick question and uh, I apologize if I, while I was fishing for documents, maybe I missed you saying this. Um, up in the first block under VSP, um, body camera hardware purchased, then there's a, a savings of 161. Um, can you can you fill us in? I mean, is that things were less expensive than anticipated or fewer, less equipment was purchased? How did we end up saving? So that, that's kind of a, a combination of a lot of different areas of savings in state police that we experienced in fiscal year 20. As we got towards the close out, we realized that we were going to be able to make payroll and have sufficient funds remaining. And so with the general funds uh, that we were able to free up and the one-time funding that was uh, appropriated a couple of years ago, coupling those two things together, we were able to purchase the equipment and get the project started in 20. Okay. And um, this is a purely an appropriations question, but are, does this mean now that each uh, officer is out with a, a body cam? The project is still in, in progress. So I don't believe any of them are live um, other than our track tactical team. Chris, I think you may not have been with us at the very beginning, maybe when Commissioner Sherling was saying that a lot of the um, team that's coming to actually in install, I guess that isn't the right word, but the body cams is, are their te the teams are coming from highly infected areas. And so there's this complication with them coming to actually implement the, the body cams. That's what I understood. Right. That's what we heard. Implement and train and stuff. Yeah. And maybe the savings is in that. Is the, the savings is just, uh, Senator, the savings is just uh, being able to pay for some of it out of fiscal 20 uh, funds. So being able to reduce the impact on fiscal 21 funds. And yeah. The travel component is a piece of what will is what uh, is a piece of what takes time. Uh, the rest of it is we have ten barracks that need installations as well as two hundred and two vehicles that need equipment uh, added to them. So um, it's not quite as easy as just strapping on a camera and uh, and hitting the road. Got it. Thank you very much. So while we're on the the uh, number three, the emergency management one, uh, this isn't directly related to the budget necessarily, but um, one of the things we heard from VSEA on Friday was that there really isn't enough PPE for the state employees and that um, in some instances, people in the corrections are actually wearing garbage bags because they don't have the appropriate equipment. And so I wondered if there's any um, in the budget, anything for that, or if that doesn't fall within the regular budget. It wouldn't fall within the regular uh, budget, Senator. And uh, I heard of that testimony and checked in with corrections and was advised they have been doing uh, in parallel with the emergency operations acquisitions of personal protective equipment. They've been doing some of their own uh, purchasing. Um, Commissioner Baker is uh, working through some of those challenges and uh, the Emergency Operations Center and the state SNS warehouse do stand ready to assist if they continue to, uh, to have challenges. Um, the personal protective equipment that we're acquiring and warehousing is uh, that uh, effort is going well, that's federal dollars. Um, and 
it's not reflected in our budget. Okay. Okay. Are we um, ready to move on? Okay. Uh, one one clarification before I move on to fire safety. It's, I said it was the uh, local emergency planning commissions doing the damage assessment. It's actually the regional planning commissions that are doing that damage assessment. Yeah. Um, so moving on to fire safety, there's um, just a uh, re small reduction in the temporary employee line item. Uh, this was a curriculum development coordinator at the fire academy. Um, we still have the position. We're just trimming the budget a little bit on that. Okay. Um, the next appropriation, the ad administration. Um, we had proposed uh, 128,000 for e-ticket contracts. Um, it turned out that there was another year of federal uh, funding available through the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, which is managed by VTRANS. So we were able to uh, apply and uh, get an award so that we no longer need this general fund. And going forward, I, my understanding is that will be encapsulated in our CAD RMS system. Um, admin reduced our temporary line item. We're not currently using temps for any of our functions. Um, travel for obvious reasons. And the rest of them are all internal service fund reductions that just you know come from those other departments that had to also trim their budget. Yep. May I ask? Yeah. Rick, e-tickets, is that are those the tickets that a, a state police uh, person would issue on the highway? I mean, are they now all e-tickets? I don't know that we have 100% e-ticket capability, but both uh, state and local law enforcement at this point have e-citation capability um, through these uh, grants from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Um, and public safety actually subgranted most of the, the funds to local law enforcement to get these printers and, and scanners and such into the cars to allow for e-citation. So I would assume that was fine for a ticket that you were issuing in person so they would know that it was, there would be a ticket some, that would surface in their, in their inbox or wherever, but it's a little difficult for a, a, a ticket that is actually issued when the driver or the operator isn't present like a parking ticket or a something else kind of ticket. I'm not sure if That's they're so using that. I can, I can clarify this a little bit. Um, Senators, Chris Herrick, um, maybe I'll put my camera on if I can figure out how. <laughs> oh, we you had it on before. Beer. You did have yep. it on. Okay. So, um, the first thing is uh, e-ticket is actually, Rich Brick mentioned that there's a printer in the cruiser. So the e is actually a function um, on a computer. It prints out a ticket, but it's, it's from a computer printer. So it's more legible. And so it's actually given to the driver and can be mailed in other cases. Got it. Um, the other uh, question you had is, we have installed these in all of the state police cruisers and a large number of local entities as well. Uh, they were, it was made available to all of them. Not every one of them applied for the subgrant, but I don't have the number in front of me, but it's a huge percentage. Uh, the goal was to have every, every cruiser statewide and a, a large majority of them are now equipped. Great, thank you, Chris. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can we go on to the forensics lab? Sure. Last appropriation is the forensic laboratory. Uh, the first two are just internal service fees. Uh, the only significant reduction was contractual line item, and that was possible due to some things that are now um, have been applied for federal funding and has been received. Uh, and then uh, right sizing, you know, based on the number of contracts we have. So it's a combination of those two things that enable us to make that cut um, without any uh, pressures. Okay. Does this in any way impact the, um, the 
testing of the rape kits. And you no, know, there was a period of time when we were way behind on them. Right. I, I can uh, I can speak to Dr. Conti, who's the director of the lab, and get back to you on that. I'm not aware of any issues. Okay. No, the the backlog is is not uh, substantial. Oh, good. Okay. Any questions? No. All right. All right. Well, I don't see any real issues here for us. I think that um, we certainly, um, Appropriations has asked us to just give them some comments on it. And I think that we're, we're going to have a discussion afterwards, but I think that we certainly will support the mental health outreach specialists and the, the co-director of the FIP and um, some of the body cam. I mean, those are, I think the main things that we were concerned about or I was anyway, I don't know the rest of the committee. So, yeah. any questions committee or comments? Okay. So, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you all. Um, I know there's a variety of our uh, partners are gonna be presenting their budgets in the next few minutes. And there's so many folks uh, doing incredible work on uh, both running their organizations, but also on the COVID response. And I know uh, Dan Bates is on the line. So I wanted to uh, give a shout out to the operations committee for his tremendous work over the last seven months in the command center for the health department. So uh, tread lightly on him, give him what he needs. We have, we, we almost always try to. We, 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 we try to be good to, well, we try to be good to everybody. You do. I'm only being facetious, but it was I an know. opportunity to call out his great work. So Good. thank you again for your time. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Megan and my Rick. And um, who else was? Oh, Matt was here. Okay, thank you. So anybody else have a, a little time crunch here that they'd like to jump Madam, into the queue? Madam Chair, it's John uh, Campbell, and it, I do also have a two, um, obviously with you, we, we'll, we'll do whatever it takes, but if it's possible. You got it. Okay. All right, and I think Annie is with us also. Yeah, in fact, actually, Annie's the one who's really going to be able to answer most of the questions uh, here, so. And we have Jennifer Harlow and Bill Boniak, and I did see that Mark Anderson was with us for a while, but I don't see him now, but the, we have a couple sheriffs here also. Okay. And you know we're not looking at the state's attorney's budget right. here, just the just the sheriff's part right. of it. And which we do is the transportation portion of it. Right. So if you if you would like a, a presentation, I, I will you know defer right to Annie, so she can go through the specific numbers and um, and then any questions as far as policy or any of that nature, uh, I'll be here to address if that's okay with you and the and the committee. Sounds fine to me, committee. Great. Go ahead. Annie. Great. Uh, good afternoon, Senators. Nice to see you all. I hope you're all well. Annie, remember you're on a Zoom meeting here and you're being broadcast out to YouTube in the world, so. Okay, thank you, Senator. Um, I will just go through the budget uh, quickly. Um, I have sent Mike documents and- um, yeah. They're on our website. Okay, perfect. So um, I think that, I think I'll try to get through it relatively quickly. The 3% cut uh, to us will be absorbed primarily through three areas. Uh, the up and down sheet will show you that um, the cut to us uh, at the sheriff's was $143,358. Uh, a small portion of that is internal service fees at about 11,372. Uh, the bulk of it's coming from per diem um, and I'll explain the per diem system to you. That's 117,000 cut um, and a mileage at about 14,000, and there's some change on those things. Um, we feel that uh, we can manage that primarily right now because the courts are doing much of their work in a, um, a remote telecommuting, uh, a teleconferencing world. So we've been able to uh, absorb those cuts because uh, the um, sheriffs are not uh, moving um, folks from the correctional facilities to the courtrooms or from uh, the correctional facilities to other other places that they're being asked to drive them. 
Our budget for the sheriffs uh, on an annual basis and for FY21 will be 4,635,000 and change. 82% of that is salary and benefits. Um, what the, uh, who is paid from the general fund in the sheriff's department are the 14 sheriffs, 14 elected county sheriffs, and the 25 state transport deputies. And those are the folks, as I mentioned before, who move people from facilities um, to, the, to the courts. We also have a budget line. So the sheriffs, basically, I think most people here know this, and um, I'll just say it just, just so it's on the record, but that the sheriffs uh, are basically a very strange concoction in the world of state government in that they are a, a, a public and private ventureship together. So the sheriffs have an operation that they run where you've seen them do uh, private contracts with like Pike Industries, where they're running um, uh, construction uh, patrols on the interstate and they have other contracts for um, with, you know, could be with a local hospital to provide security. Um, uh, they have other contracts even in state government. But um, so we, so in essence, we are, the general fund is putting about 4.6 million into the sheriff's operations. Uh, it is for those groups, the 14 sheriffs and the transport deputies. And they also pay uh, two other items, which are primarily per diem money and mileage. Now the per diems are only, are uh, generally um, can work for the sheriffs um, doing other work for the sheriffs, uh, some of their other contract work. When they're working for us, the sheriffs bill us for their time and, um, and we also pay for mileage moving people back and forth. But about, it's about $356,000 of money for per diems. Now you think maybe why would we need to have a per diem budget when we actually have full-time state transport deputies? Well, uh, first thing one is that not every county has a per diem. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, has a state transport deputy. Two of the counties do not. So they always use per diems when they have to move people. Uh, some of the counties only have one or two. So if someone is out on, um, is out sick or they're out on workers comp or something like that, we will need to have a per diem utilization. And then there are times when we're asked uh, specifically if they can um, uh, use additional folks on a transport, they may have a they may be using people in the van and they, uh, for efficiency and they feel that they need to have an extra body or two. And so they w talk to central office and we approve that. So for the most part, their budget is, is pretty much just some salary per diem and mileage. And that's it from the general fund. Um, you are probably wondering, you know, what did the scope, the landscape look like once they shut down? So on average, the sheriff's, um, program, they transport 565 persons a month. Um, that's what the, uh, the state transport deputies on average are doing. When the courts closed down in mid-March of, of um, 2020, we, that was basically three and a half months. So what we estimated was that um, we would see a drop of about 1,946 less transports. And uh, we came pretty close with the projection. Um, we actually, for FY20, ended up by transporting 4,482. That was the actual. We had estimated that they would transport 4,838. 4, so we were off by a few hundred, about 400, but we still felt like that was, that was pretty, pretty good. And we adjusted the budget accordingly when we had to make the cuts. We made it to the per diem program. We made it to the mileage program. And I think that we're going to be able to manage uh, very well. One of the things uh, that um, I, I'll raise two issues. One is that the carry forward budget, and I, you you know what carry forwards you know are all about. So the carry forward budget um, has also allowed us to assist the sheriff's departments with um, with things that they need uh, that the department doesn't necessarily have the ability to budget for. Uh, but for example, if they uh, if they needed uh, you know to improve their radio um, their their radios, we might be able to support them with that. Sometimes uh, a couple of years ago, we helped them um, gave them a small stipend so that that some of their folks could could um, get some better uniforms. So we don't do a lot in terms of carry forward, but we do take a look at the fact that the sheriffs um, uh, don't necessarily, at the rate that we pay for per diems, at the rate that we pay for the cars sitting when they are not, they're not moving around. Uh, the sheriffs have to buy those cars, outfit those cars. 
they're sitting at court for eight hours, they're not paying for themselves. So we do try to help the sheriffs with some of the carry forward. This year, we have very little carry forward um, available to us. And I'm just gonna see if I can pull that up so I can see what our carry forward, just to, re to talk about that. Um, our FY20 carry forward is 102,500. One of the things um, that we are a little <coughs> bit concerned about is two things. One is that has to pay any prior year purchases from FY20 that have not yet come through. But the other thing would be if we are in a situation where the state transport deputies need body cams, um, we don't know how we'll manage, manage to pay for that with, with that amount of money plus the storage. So um, I think I'll stop and see if there are questions um, from the senators um, or anybody else that, Madam Chair. So I um, have no doubt that uh, the general fund will, I mean, that we'll be able to do it and I don't worry about that. But I, I do worry about the, um, the sustainability of the sheriffs themselves, of the sheriff's offices because of the bizarre way we, we treat them and fund them. And so they're not eligible for some things because they're a government entity but yet on the other hand, they're not eligible through small business association because they're, I mean, because they're a government entity, they're not eligible for SBA and because they're um, entrepreneurs, they're not eligible for some, it's, it's a, so I do, I do worry about the way we fund them, which has nothing to do with necessarily with your, your budgeting here, but um, I do worry about their their sustainability, um, and um, I, I'm not sure. That's a longer term question than this budget, but we do need. It is something we do really need to address, I believe. Anthony, yeah, this is kind of a random thought as well. It's kind of random as well, but when I hear, I, I, we always hear about how the sheriffs do contracting out and they submit bills and they have contracts with various groups, whether it's a hospital, they do stuff on the highway, whatever they do. They must do a lot of administrative work. It seems like, you know, there must be, is there a lot of administrative overhead for sheriffs that they have to deal with? I mean, who's taking care of all these contracts and everything? Well, when Jennifer first came on, the first time she came in and testified, we asked her if she was surprised when she's been on the job, I think seven months. And, um, she's a law enforcement officer. That's what she wants to do. And she's doing a lot of desk work and administrative right. work. And she said she was stunned by that. So they're doing it. Yeah, no, it just seems unfortunate. It should, 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 should be a better way of doing it, it seems. It just seems like it bogs down the sheriff who should be out doing law enforcement work. Yeah. I my, don't think you'd get any uh, argument from the sheriffs about that. Or from Jeanette. <laughs> Or That's probably important. from John Campbell. Right. Or from John. Yeah. So uh, given that, I mean, this is slightly off subject, but so how do we change that? Well, I mean, that's we, not, not in this, not in this conversation. Right. I realize, but that's, that's a conversation perhaps we'd like to uh, have in the future after we, we're this it, period. I believe that, I believe that it's a conversation we've been leading up to for the last three years or four years. I, and I, I think that there are hopefully some some answers, but I don't I don't know. It's going to take a lot of work to do it because it's a whole culture in Vermont the way we address these. But it'll take will, two weeks, that's for sure. I would say this, Madam Chair, that if um, when the sheriffs get hit with certain um, certain uh, requests, so for example, if the auditor, um, if the state auditor sends them a long laundry list of things. Right. Um, we try to help them as best we can. So uh, Barb Bernardini and Ashley Perry at our office, myself, will try to do that. Even sometimes with public records requests uh, that come in, which can be very time consuming, I think, as you all know, uh, whenever we can, we try to assist mm -hmm. the sheriffs with those kinds, of, uh, those kinds of issues that come to them. However, you're absolutely correct that, in, that you know, I, they, they employ their own administrative folks to do a lot of that, a lot of the work to manage and 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 uh, schedule and control all of that, and it is it is quite a bit uh, on them. I, I I I we talk to them frequently only because we're talking to them about stuff that they're submitting to us, and it's very difficult um, sometimes if we ask them for you know to get something to us because we know that they're extremely extremely busy. 
Mm -hmm. I'd like to be, you know, just clear for Senator Plena, um, the contract issues, because those are the, you know, private portion of, their, of the business of the sheriffs, that um, we do not uh, deal with those contracts. We don't help them with any of the um, uh, administrative aspects of those. It's just the, uh, the transport uh, issues. Right. Right. Some of the other matters that they deal with that that we consider to be strictly law enforcement, such as uh, some of the public records requests. Yep. Yeah, thanks. Any questions or concerns or comments? We'll start here. Madam Chair, I know that uh, uh, Sheriff Harlow and Sheriff Boniak are on. I don't know if they if there's anything I missed that they might want to add. Hello there, Sheriff Boniak, you're in your car. You're on, also on mute, and I hope you're not driving. I'm gonna say that. <laughs> I'm, parked, I'm parked by Gifford Medical Center. So I'm out and about, and uh, I have better connection out here in the field than I do at my office. So <laughs> it's, uh, and it's good to be out and about seeing, that's where, you know, our, state deputies are doing too. They're out and about patrolling, you know, uh, our areas and uh, it makes a difference in our communities, especially with still a lot of people not working. And we're still having a lot of issues with um, family disturbances, domestic issues. So um, there's a lot of stuff going on and Annie, you did a great job. Thank you. And you too, John. Um, so, you know, we're always looking at the uh, per diem, uh, the rate that the per diems, they're currently at a, approximately $18 an hour. Most of the sheriffs today are paying around 20. Uh, so there's still, some sheriffs are losing $2 an hour, you know, with the per diems. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, at some point, you know, we'll address that. And I'd love to have a conversation with Senator White and Senator Clarkson in, in reference to, um, what we do to change the sheriffs here in Vermont. I know you've been talking about it for the last couple of years. And uh, I, I think it, at this time and point, in, uh, we should talk about it. And um, I think it's time for a change, it really is. Thank you, you're right. Jeff Harlow, do you have anything to add? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just basically was here to learn to, so I can better understand what's going on and mm -hmm. and things, but I really appreciate everything. Like Annie is a lifesaver for me. She's helped me out tremendously in my position. And I greatly appreciate it as well as other sheriffs. And I'm thankful that I, you know, as Sheriff Boniak, I'm also able to get on the road more with my guys, which I really appreciate. Not as much as I'd like, but I'm starting to get a little bit um, I don't want to say comfortable, but I'm managing my time a little bit better right now. And the state deputies, you know, transport deputies like Sheriff Boniak said, they're out, um, you know, helping us, backing us up, doing things as much as we can to show a greater presence in the state, um, the interesting times that we're seeing currently in our community. So I know that our communities have definitely appreciated the um, uptick in seeing more deputies out on the road. Um, so. But thank you all for listening and thank you for letting me be a part of this today. And Senator White, if I could add to the committee, um, mm -hmm. uh, Sheriff Harlow has done an incredible job up there in a very short period of time. And um, I know her constituents are very happy with her. And um, we, you know, as she said, Annie, I think Annie sort of adopted uh, Jen um, when she came on. And, uh, you know, it's one of those situations. It's really nice to see um, how some of the folks and when they you know first get appointed or elected that they uh, they shine and, and she's one of our shining stars that's for sure great so this is a small um it's a budget item and it's relatively small perhaps but i've always felt that there's some inequity in the way we uh deal with um serving i guess it's just called serving papers so sure. yes. when the sheriffs do it they have to pay 15 percent of the cost back to the state. And when the constables do it, they don't pay anything back to the state. Has there ever been any thought about doing away with that um, requirement that they pay it back? 
Well, you know, that's been on the books for a while. And I, I do, I agree. I just find that if, um, you know, if the constables are not, not knocking the constables, because uh, again, no. the process has to be served. But um, I, I think the sheriffs are definitely at a disadvantage uh, because that is part of the money that's coming in for them to help, uh, you know, pay for cruisers and pay for, uh, um, you know, the uniforms, pay for weapons, things of that nature. So uh, as, when I say weapons, I'm talking about just regular sidearms that are that are uh, for regular uh, patrol. But the the point is, is that if you have somebody that doesn't doesn't have to have that kind of overhead, um, they'll, you know, can do it for less money, um, then, you know, the, some people will get cut off. So I, I think that would be, uh, even though we don't really deal with that aspect of their budget, I, I think it's something that it would be great for the legislature to, to take a look at. Okay. Right. Plus they haven't had an increase in, in many, many years to that. And I know that part of the issue now is the sheriffs, um, uh, you know, have talk, talked to me about the fact that, you know, they go to serve a paper and sometimes it's multiple trips Mm -hmm. uh, to, to get them delivered. And it could be, you know, right. um, uh, you know, hours and hours out of a day to try to deliver something. And so that has created, you know, a real drain on resources and they haven't had an increase to that rate, uh, for years and years. I want to, I can't remember, but maybe Sheriff Bonyak does, but it's probably been at least a dozen years or longer. You're correct. And it's, it has been around, uh, 10 to 12 years. And, uh, we did introduce a bill as past sessions. Unfortunately, COVID hit and it kind of got put on the wayside for now, but the bill was out there. Um, we were looking for an, for an increase. And you're right, you know, some lawyers say after three service, three attempts, um, request a uh, tack order. Some other ones will say, you know, keep trying until you, you know, so, we're actually, we lose money every time we, you know, especially got to travel, you know, the mileage adds up and, uh, you know, the time itself. But mm -hmm. the other part of it, I know years ago, um, some of the sheriffs said uh, they thought the 15% was for the sheriff's salary increases from the state. Um, so I don't know if that's true or not, uh, but but it's something you know to look at once again. Okay. Brian. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't know whether John or um, Bill or uh, Annie might be able to answer, but and I know it's not necessarily our purview today, but if we were able to put the sheriffs and the constables on equal ground in terms of uh, process serving, what's the foregone impact on the budget? Do you have any idea? I, we wouldn't have that. Um, we wouldn't have it. I don't, Annie. I don't think you, unless you you came across that. Um, but Senator, I'm more than happy to to get back to you on that uh, with the answer to that question. We um, did. We did. I think Mark Anderson gave it to us some time ago, and I don't remember what it was. Um, I do, We do have that, Senator. I think. Um, I think we. I provided it to Mark and Sheriff McLaughlin this year, uh, and it was just a matter of. Um, how much money the 15% puts to the general fund. I think that's Senator Collimore's question. I do think I have, I think I have that in my email and I'll go back and look for it when we get off this call. And if I get find it, I'll send it into Mike Braun. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Wasn't some, um, I could be wrong, completely off base, but I thought it was something like 150,000 a year. That's what I remember is somewhere around in there. So, you know, just if you want to look at the other side of it with the constables, how much are they doing? We have no idea. So right, because they don't report at all. Exactly. So, and it's no it's no disrespect to the constables. It's it's just a matter of, you know, when the when you really look at you know in this time of especially COVID, uh, where you know money's tight, and if the state needs that few extra dollars, you could be you could be looking at another you know, uh, anywhere from 50 to hundred thousand dollars that you're, you're missing out on. So, or you're missing out on if you didn't have to back. Back. Well, I know several of the sheriffs, um, uh, we noticed our civil process dropped down to about one quarter of what we normally do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're, we're taking a hit on that too. 
Anything more committee on? Thank you. Great. Thank, thank are you. Are you very on your front porch, John? Mr. <laughs> yes, Kim? I am. And unfortunately, my allergies are really kicking up. There's something that's, that's going, as I said, I just told Patty that uh, I think next next uh, conference call, I'm going inside. She can come outside. So. Goldenrod has uh, just come out down here. Yeah, I think that might be it because uh, I feel like I'm about to rip my eyes out. So, <laughs> Don't do it on screen. <laughs> yeah, I won't. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you, committee members. Thank you, senators. Thank you, Annie. You too. Bye bye. Bye bye. Sheriff, Sheriff Boniak. Okay, should we jump to um, emergency uh, emergency management services? Dan. And I see we have Drew with us also. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I don't really have. I don't want to waste your time. I don't have a lot to say today. Um, our budget was largely unchanged uh, in the proposal. Uh, so we're sort of, uh, from the health department standpoint, in a place where we support uh, uh, what was proposed for us uh, and don't have a, a lot of concerns or complaints. So um, I, I will uh, I'll yield my time then to uh, our stakeholders if they want to talk a little bit more about it. But um, unless you have significant questions, we don't have a lot of uh, testimony to offer you today on this one other than that we're satisfied with where we are. Okay, yeah, we should probably hear from the people in the field to see if they're satisfied with where we you are. Bet. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Dan first and then we'll jump to Drew? No. Okay, Drew? So I, I um, have not had an opportunity to see what uh, impact on um, services this uh, budget proposal will have. Um, the, the one piece I would speak to is the need to fill the um, vacant position of the um, training administrator. Uh, we were told uh, the advisory committee um, was, was told that it was a possibility that, that position would not be filled as a uh, going uh, forward as a vacant position. So. Uh, the only thing that uh, I would add is that we would like to see that training administrator position and now the open uh, chief of services uh, filled their important positions in order for us to continue you know, providing EMS. Can you, I, can you talk about a little bit about that? Um, those uh, and I'm yeah. going to see what's going on with my phone here. Uh, yes, ma'am. So, uh, I can, I can offer you a couple of updates on that. So uh, it's not our intent to leave the training uh, administrator position open. Uh, we, we currently have two open positions right now, uh, the EMS chief and the uh, state training administrator. Um, we're waiting for approval uh, from uh, human resources to uh, hire the chief. Uh, with the uh, hiring freeze on, we have to uh, go through the process to, to allow us to hire that. Uh, the comment I made at the advisory committee, and uh, I'm sorry, Drew, if it was a little confusing, is that we just wanted to wait until we had approval for the chief before we opened the process to, to before we reopened the process to hire the training administrator, uh, just because if there was any negotiation, that chief position is a little bit more important to us. Um, but it's still our intent to fill it. It just will mean that we'd rather prioritize the chief's position because that has the broader reach. Um, uh, we're now in the second week awaiting approval for the hiring of that chief's position. We're hoping that we will hear any day now. Uh, we're rattling the cages as much as we can rattle them. Uh, and that process will open as soon as we have everything ready to go as soon as we're, uh, as soon as we're approved. If we get approval, we'll open both positions simultaneously. And then it will just be a matter of getting the right candidate, which is uh, some of you may know has been a very difficult process for us. Uh, over the last couple of years is keeping that position filled. So uh, there's nobody uh, in, in the world of EMS that wants those positions filled more than I do. Um, uh, so I certainly will do everything we can um, and uh, we'll do our best. Would it be helpful if this committee, is it DHR? It where is Where the DHR, approval comes yeah. from? Huh? Would it be helpful if this committee um, and wrote to them and encouraged them to um, give the approval to hire for these two positions? I think from an official standpoint, I should probably say that uh, it's not my place to say that. 
Um, uh, but uh, again, I'll, I'll yield to uh, my stakeholders to, to make any judgments on that. Drew, would it be helpful? Uh, uh, from my perspective, I think it would be helpful. These positions are, are you know, very important. Uh, one of our long-term um, workforce development challenges has been um, the, the vacant uh, training position in the, in the state. And certainly with Dan as the chief, we were, we were making um, progress and having a lot of uh, cooperative work done with the EMS office. And um, I'm concerned that with that position vacant, uh, we're gonna be set back further uh, from kind of where we were. Uh, knowing that Dan's taking on you know, more responsibilities in other areas um, and not being able to completely give us all of his time, um, EMS needs that, uh, that position. Can you send, um, could you send us some information about the two positions just so that um, we're clear about what they are and what their responsibilities are? If you can send that to the committee members, then we'll, we'll um, work up a letter. Is that I'll okay, committee? Are you okay with that? Yeah, I think we want to know what we want to know is the impact of not filling the position. What's the negative impact of not filling the position? Mm -hmm. Well, that I can give you, um, you know, obviously the, the EMS chief's position is the principal liaison between EMS agencies in the state of Vermont. Uh, as Drew mentioned, uh, we've done, we've made a great deal of ground up in the last couple of years uh, with that outreach, with uh, making sure that the voice of the provider is heard by not just the legislature, but also uh, the administrative sides of the Department of Health. So the impact of not having that person in the role means that um, uh, that there's gonna be a gap there. And uh, that's that's a challenge. And that's, um, it means pretty much everything that we do is, is one step removed uh, from its, oper from, from being operationalized. So I think there's a big impact. Uh, the training administrator is, um, uh, in charge of all of the uh, principal licensing and continuing education for the state of Vermont EMS uh, system. Um, uh, we've, it's been vacant now for 18 months. Uh, so uh, we've done everything we can to shift uh, responsibilities around on our team, meet those responsibilities, but there is a gap when it's open. Um, we're, uh, I'm, I'm fond of saying that if, if we're not innovating, we're moving backwards and we've certainly not been able to innovate in the way that we want to. Uh, we've not been able to support the educators uh, in the way that we want to. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so there's a gap. Um, and when that's open, that's, that's a challenge. Now, just to be clear, we're not restricted from hiring that. Uh, HR has authorized that position. Uh, they recently authorized it. Um, uh, so we haven't opened it up. We're just pausing awaiting the determination of the chief's uh, outcome before we, we post it. Um, we've had four candidates since it was originally posted and they've all, uh, for one reason or another, uh, come almost to the end of the process and not worked out at the last minute. So it's been a very frustrating uh, uh, couple of years on this position, it's been tough. So the, that one has been approved though for hiring, it's the chief operations. Um, a position correct. that you need to get approval for. Okay. Any more questions or comments? Allison? Well, it just, it just strikes me that this training administrator is so key given all this money that we are trying to coordinate with attracting, marketing, getting more EMS people in that that training administration job is key to making that happen and happen successfully. So we wish they were on now. Mm -hmm. yeah. I 100% I, I agree with you. And like I said, there's no one that makes that wish any stronger than I do. Um, yeah. uh, no, it's, know, it, we're now all clear on that because we've been working so hard to direct that those CRF funds and, and this additional money for EMS training. So yeah. And, and need somebody Minister it. <laughs> For sure. You know, this vacancy is, is, is reflective of a lot of the challenges that EMS faces in Vermont. You know, we, we want a high level manager. We want a paramedic that's in there that can, that can 
understand all of the levels of our system. But the problem is that our, our farm team is not very deep. Uh, there's only 300 paramedics in the entire state. Uh, and um, the folks that uh, are prepared at the level that we want them to be prepared for uh, are gainfully employed in, in many situations and not looking for new jobs if they already have one in Vermont. We've been forced to look out of state and the challenge, as you know, of bringing someone into Burlington area with a high cost of living is, is difficult. Um, so we've, we've met a lot of obstacles with this position and uh, it's, been, it's been tough. So with what we've learned about working from home, there's no reason why the person has to be located in Burlington now. They can no. come to in, Brattleboro or Woodstock. Yeah, and in fact, um, that is a change that we made in the last posting of this position. Uh, so historically, um, for the last couple of years at least, it has been uh, tethered to, Bur to Burlington area. In the last posting, we opened that up to say that we are open to uh, any kind of virtual arrangement that we could make. We had a candidate that we thought was going to work out that way. And, and again, it just became down to dollars and cents and it didn't work out. Um, but you know, the, the hard part with this process is uh, to get somebody to the very end of that process is months of, of work. And uh, when it crashes at the last minute, you're just set back. But uh, 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 Madam Chair, I, I absolutely agree with you that um, there's no reason this needs to be tethered to Burlington. I fought for that for a long time with Internally, I fought for that, uh, and I think I think we can make that happen. And, and quite frankly, I think uh, Drew will echo my uh, my feelings on this. That I think it's a good thing to have a training administrator located in Brattleboro or Woodstock. I think it helps us represent the the system better. Uh, and and there's no you know there's there's nobody walking into Burlington office to to, to you know for us to help them. It, our whole world is virtual, so I, I wholeheartedly agree. So would this person be, Allison would know about this, um, eligible. It seems to me we have a couple programs. One is if somebody has a job to come to Vermont that they can get some relief with um, moving expenses or something like that. Um, would uh, they be, would this person be eligible for that program? They might, they might well be eligible for the new worker, uh, the relocation program. And that program is even though it's been sidelined a little bit by COVID, uh, it that is still operational because it's an e it, it's all uh, an online application. It's a, it's it's easy more easy to administer than remote worker, which is more backburnered right now, uh, partly because people are already moving uh, without any assistance to Vermont without that incentive. But we're pushing very hard for these, and and th that new worker program is still is going to be back in in the next month. Will be. Uh, operational again, and uh, they have approved 24 people. There are more people in the queue, and they've had 150 applicants already. So, uh, absolutely, it would be appropriate. We've actually uh, offered moving assistance. The Department of Health has supported. I think the last applicant we offered up to two thousand or three thousand dollars in moving assistance. Uh, not not the last one, but the, the one prior to the last one. Uh, we had offered moving assistance too. He was coming from Ohio, and it, again, it just didn't work out. But uh, so we we have we have had that in our arsenal to try to lure folks in. Um, but great, and it just hasn't worked out. So, uh, if I may ask, Madam Chair, what mm -hmm. what was what derailed the final candidate when the the person you thought was so good, and what derailed that in the final analysis? Well, uh, without getting too specific about the candidate uh, themselves, uh, it was just dollars and cents. Uh, it came down to the fact that the candidate was making um, uh, more money than we could offer uh, doing the jobs. Plural. She, this candidate had a, a couple of different jobs that they were into, and the uh, we, we couldn't we couldn't offer a package that was competitive that would make the change appropriate. And that That's happened. So nice. In fact, that was the last, really the last three candidates we've had. It this came down to finally them. dollars and cents. Well, you know, I, I'm just curious because we know in Senate Economic Development that across the boards, we underpay in Vermont on, in every sector of business about 20%. Would that 20% have made a difference in that job offer? Um, it's hard to say, but, but I think maybe. 
Um, you know, my instincts would say yes, but we were very close. Um, in all three of the last three candidates, we came down to very tight negotiations and it just, just couldn't work out. Um, I think the cost of living had a lot to do with, you know, so we had in the last three candidates, two were from out of state and one was an in-state. And the two from out of state, it just came down to the cost of living that we could we could make them competitive with the salary. But when they added the cost of moving to the Burlington area and the high cost of living, it didn't make sense. I know an empty house right in here in Putney. <laughs> well, if you if you know any paramedics who want a job, let me know. I'll be happy <laughs> to discuss it with them. Any more questions or but if you can get that to us, we'll send a letter to HR about the the chief operations person. I'll be glad to send you the information about physician. Anything else? Committee? Okay. No, just frustration about the training yeah. job. We share your frustration, Cindy. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So I think that we have um, next Carrie Brown. Are you going to um, talk to us about the Women's Commission budget? I see you there someplace. And just um, for information purposes, uh, should we get there? I see it's 216 right now. Senator Collimore has to leave to go talk about um, a cluster in Rutland. So he'll be leaving us at 2.30. Well, it's uh, Dr. Levine has called a, a uh, session to deal with the situation in Killington. Got it. Killington, not Rutland, but his county. Oh, it's Rutland County. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. So Carrie? Although, although it's perilously close to Windsor County. Well, we, we could take care of that maybe in um, reapportionment. <laughs> Happily not today. <laughs> so just for your information, the reapportionment board is all appointed now. The last person was appointed who happens to be our tenant. Who uh, <laughs> I, I recall you had a hand in, in proposing this person. I, I did, and she is excited. It's looking at maps and deviations for population and stuff. Yeah. Great. Hi, Carrie. Hi. Hello. All right. So Carrie, would you like to? Yes. Thank you all very much. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about my budget uh, and um, to answer any questions that you have. Um, we have been asked to reduce our budget by 3% which we have done. Um, I want to stress that uh, every single year we are asked to reduce our budget to some degree. And usually it takes the form of being asked for a level funded budget, um, and, which means that we have to, since our personnel costs go up and our allocated expenses, our I, ISF expenses go up, then we have to make reductions somewhere else. So um, every year, the portion of our budget that is that we have any say over gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And it includes um, travel, office supplies, um, cell phones, um, printing, and postage. And that's it. That's all we have any say over. So, um, so that's just to kind of give you a, a little context, not to complain about it because we can always somehow make it work. But every year I have this feeling of, is this the year we're not gonna be able to make it work? And so, um, so in our tiny little budget, our budget is just under $400,000 this year. A 3% reduction is quite significant. And yeah. we are able to do it this year. Seems like every year we have some kind of lucky little circumstance that lets us make it through. This year, um, because we have moved to all online meetings, we have cut out any mileage reimbursement for our commissioners. So that's about $5,500 that we're able to save. Um, and 
we also had another just sort of stroke of luck, if you would call it, that the family situation of one of our employees changed such that she went from family coverage in her health insurance down to two person coverage. Um, so it's not something we could have planned on or asked for, but it was sort of a fortunate timing that it came along right when it did. Otherwise, we were going to have no choice but to make cuts to our staff time because there was there's really just literally nothing else left. And so um, so we're so we're fine. you know, we're able to keep everybody on and continue doing our work on the same, shoestring that we're very accustomed to doing it. We're very, very frugal and um, we've got a lot of practice in that. And really our, the majority of our expenses and where we need our financial support is to our staff um, because that's, we're not really, we don't um, spend a lot of money on and we don't need to spend a lot of money on anything else. It really is the time that people have to put into it. Uh, we're incredibly busy right now because um, this pandemic is having quite a strikingly disproportionate impact on women. And so we're doing a lot of data collection, a lot of analysis of what that means, documenting that. Um, and it's it actually every, kind of every time we go back and look at it, it's, it looks a little bit worse. I was just looking at unemployment numbers today and we've been tracking the share of women's and men's unemployment since April. And typically, men make up the majority of unemployment claims, but that flipped in April. Um, so there were, a, it was like 46% to 40% women to men. But then ever since then, it's been getting steadily worse and worse every month until in, um, in July, 64% of the unemployment claims in Vermont were women compared to 36% for men. So it's um, not completely sure what's at the bottom of that, but at any rate, there's, there's a lot going on for women right now. So we're well working on that. <laughs> and you've been great partners with ACCD rolling out these grants, uh, our CRF funding grants. Uh, and, and so you take on and wear many hats. Um, yes. I, may I ask a question, Madam Chair? Yes, please. Um, so Carrie, given this fiscal squeeze you've experienced for at least the last six years, I mean, for as long as, I mean, for, for a long time, do you also, what percent of your budget do you bring in on grants and are you penalized in, in, in bringing more in, on, in grant funding outside of uh, taxpayer funding? Yeah, we, um, we don't, we, uh, it's an unusual circumstance for us to receive grants. Um, we, <laughs> we received a very large one a couple of years ago to do a paid family and medical leave feasibility study right. which was from the US Department of Labor. That was unusual and it all went to this one specific project. Um, we every once in a while we'll get like a couple thousand dollars here and there for always earmarked for specific projects. And um, so it's not something that we that we build into our budget or count on at all. It's not they're never anything that can support our general operating expenses on an ongoing basis. Um, have not noticed any penalty that we've incurred for that. Um, so that's it's but it's not something that we that we can count on. But also, it takes time and administrative time and effort yeah. to, to, to do those, to research them and to apply for them. But it, it strikes me that so much of what your work, I mean, so your work is so good and the results are so uh, useful that it it strikes me that, that there would be granting opportunities to help supplement this budget that is so constrained. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that where that could come into play would be uh, when we have particular projects that um, we need to get done, or if, we, if we've got, for, for instance, this past year, we had carry forward from the year before, so we were able to create a temporary position of a data management coordinator, and we had somebody who worked part-time on a temporary basis, which was fantastic. Um, I would love to have somebody permanent doing data management, because it's such an, a crucial part of what we do, but that was a... Um, that was a, a, a temporary kind of defined position and project that they were working on. And so that's where grants can be useful to us. Uh. Any questions or, I guess there's not much we can do about your budget. Well, 
we could advocate for it not to be cut 3%. Well, we could, but um, if this year might not, if if they already have been able to realize some savings through the right. travel and it's, it would be hard to justify right. that this budget as opposed to other budgets. I mean. Right, except she's also taken on COVID work. I mean, uh, the Commission on Women, in case the rest of you don't know, has taken on overseeing $5 million of grants that have been uh, designated for women and minority owned businesses. Mm -hmm. So Carrie has done, uh, we're hoping to hear later this week in Senate Economic Development, mm -hmm. I hope, um, how, how that's rolling out. And so they've taken that on additionally. So. I, yeah, yeah. So that was, I, a, that was not something that we had. Justify yeah. further support. Yeah. We did not have that in our in our work plan for this year. Um, I know, and it turned out to be uh, a really fantastic program. Got a lot of help to a lot of people, and um, even though we the majority of work didn't fall on our shoulders, it was still quite a lot of work for us, but much more for other people. Chris, thank thank you. Yeah. So um, uh, on that last bit, you know, sometimes when people handle grants for someone else they become a well, fiscal conduit sort of a fancy thing but I mean do you, do you get any kind of I guess I'm concerned are you being asked to work for no compensation when you take on those kinds of tasks like yes. or does it displace work that you would have otherwise done or does COVID displace that work otherwise done and so now you're doing COVID driven work right that, so that's a great question um, because COVID really did throw everything kind of into a new light and it has you know, since March. So our work has really focused on COVID, um, which obviously we didn't plan for. Um, we were not giving out grants, ACCD maintained, maintained that. And so we weren't acting as any kind of fiscal pass through for that grant money, um, which is good because that, that was one of the ideas that had been proposed along the way. And, and we were pretty clear that we weren't we didn't have the, the capacity to do that right. um so it, if we were going to be asked to do that we'd have to bring on additional staff and so that and it wasn't it wasn't practical from anybody's point of view okay. um so it's a so it's a kind of funny thing because we're uh you know we do the work that needs to be done and um it's it's possible that there may be some COVID really funds that are able to help offset some of the additional time that we've had to spend on COVID related work, but uh, I don't actually know for sure yet if that's the case. Um, so uh, again, not something we can count on. Okay, and then just so I make sure I understand your earlier remarks, did you say that you've had flat budgets or declining budgets in preceding years? Right, so we're asked, we have been asked for the past um, several years, um, almost every year we're asked for a level funded budget. Okay. So they ask us to develop a budget that's the same. Um, and or, in order to do that, we have to make cuts to various parts of the budget so that it, because the personnel costs are going up right. no matter what. And so, um, so the overall number for our budget has been going up just a little bit because we can honestly never make it level funded, it never quite works out. Um, but the, but the money that we have any kind of control over has had to be cut every year. Right. Well, I mean, I guess the concern when someone gets stuck in level budget land, it's even even just with inflation, you know, you're you're being asked to do the same mission with less money effectively mm -hmm. every year. It's kind of a starvation budget, and it worries me. What's what's the total appropriation now from the state? So for the FY21 is 399 yeah. and yeah. something. Okay. Yeah. And you've got our, our ups and downs document in your yeah. folder. So you can see the changes that we made to what we had originally requested. We, we, I don't, I don't see that on our website. Has that just been added, Mike Ferrant? It has. Um, I got it about half an hour ago and put it up on the website. If you hit refresh on the committee's website, actually, I'll send a link to yeah, it. Hey, if it's on the website, I can find it. Okay. Ryan, are you waving goodbye or do you have a question? 
you're waving goodbye. Bye. <laughs> Um, and just one more note about the personnel costs. We have three staff members. Two of them are um, not exempt. And so it's their, their pay, it step increases and cost of living increases, but I am exempt. And so we, that's another area where we have some flexibility over how we spend that money. So I don't always um, get a salary increase depending on the year and depending on how we're managing to balance our budget. Well, and I think of you as sort of an extender to, you know, what the state does. So do you get, are you able to offer your employees a package similar to what a state employee would be offered? We are all state employees. Oh, you are, I'm sorry. I didn't realize that that was, I'm glad yeah. to hear that. Yeah, so so they get, they get what all, we all get what all state employees get. Okay, thank you. Yeah, or are, are, they, are they union members? Yes, they are. But you're exempt, so obviously. I'm exempt, so I'm not, yeah. Thank you for that clarification. That's actually reassuring to know yeah. that you're in the regular pool, right? So any more questions or comments or? Just frustration. Mm -hmm. and, and a thank you for all your CRF help. Because even though you didn't administer it, you were instrumental in orchestrating it. Well, thank you all for funding it and making it happen. <laughs> okay, anything else? Thank you, Carrie. Thank you so much. So committee, I, with that, we don't have anything else on the agenda for today. We, we, did we have, um, was the, Ver Chris Burkell, was he not going to come and chat with us about the Criminal Justice Training Council? Oh, yes, he was. I don't know where. Uh, I didn't ever see him there. Well, we'll, I guess we'll get him another time. Um, so I think that what we have, just in terms of budget stuff, the the areas that we deal with are most of our stuff is not um, particularly budget related, but I think that um, what we talked about was the racial equity advisory panel um, suggesting that <coughs> they might have 150,000 additional money. I don't know. We haven't decided that yet. Um, Human Rights Commission didn't want their 3% their, um, cut, but I'm not sure how to how to justify asking them not to take a cut when we when other people are, and DPS, the mental health outreach specialists and stuff. I think we can. We should have this conversation tomorrow. I was hoping that we could have it today, but I didn't know that Brian was going to not be with us, and I think that we need to make sure that he's with us for this, and then also have the conversation about the VSEA language. Um, around the opening the the union contract. Okay. Is that? Uh, yes, and yes. We're, we're hearing from Vince Luzzi and Steve a little later. I mean, we began it with Steve the other day, but on Friday, but uh, is Vince also test? I can't remember, I, I just- no, I, I don't know that there's anything more than- not much more, No, not, there's not much more to say. Right. right. Um, we just have to have the conversation and decide what to do and what to say to appropriations. And um, they did, I think they reported out S-233 on the floor today. Oh, they did? They had a few changes, but they were pretty minor. And I don't know what they're um, doing with S-220. They did have some changes in there, but I'm going to have to find out why the the um, the on the floor there was a an amendment about the um, uh, energy plan training module that Tim Ash and some people put on as a and saying that they would tell us what they're doing and then the OPR would def, would um, have some kind of a module 
um, worked up that if they didn't, if the professions didn't do training around uh, climate change and energy, that then they would take that. And the House, I believe, is putting in there that they have to take that for license and, and the um, initial license and then every two years for renewal. And I, I'm going to ask them, it seems to me a waste of time to have somebody take the same two-hour course every two years. But Right. Really? It's like you want something new. But the, but the, it, it is one training module for two hours on our energy plan. And I, I don't know how you would justify mm -hmm. doing it every two years, having people sit through the same two hours, but I'll find out from them. Right. There's so much changing. It would be, strike me as very surprising if two years on, someone was offering the same training and no but chris it's not the profession itself the profession itself is doing all the training around energy right. work this is a module that this the director of opr has to design to speak to our energy goals this isn't this is just here are your ener here are vermont's energy goals and and it's the same for all professions. It isn't as if it would be different for furnace installers than for real estate people. Well, <laughs> you know, I'm supportive of the idea. It, it does, it's a, it's a tricky thing. I mean, who's going to, uh, if someone hears that 10 VSA 578 talks about greenhouse gas reductions as a state goal, there's, there's a lot of miles between that and what are you going to do as a installer that actually helps the state get there. So, um, but I, I don't want to prejudge. I just, I wonder who's who's going to be the, the liaison that's going to translate the state energy goals into sort of meaningful terms for people who then install and maintain things that help us get there. Well, that's what we, in ours, what we asked for was a, a OPR to, get a, um, uh, to look at all the training that is being done by engineers, real estate agents, um, furnace installers, all of the people that were listed there and ask them what they're, what they're currently doing because engineers are doing a lot. Right. And um, so do they really need to sit for two hours and listen to our state energy goals? <laughs> yeah. Well, we'd probably be a lot better off uh, putting, if we really wanted to make a change, start putting some uh, resources into building inspectors around the state. You know, yeah. If we started building to code more, um, which I'm hearing more and more support for, because those who build to code um, suffer a competitive disadvantage when other people don't bother to build to code. Mm -hmm. And um, building to code is actually cost effective, but we don't regulate for that. And you know, from <laughs> being around this discussion about listing builders, um, registering builders, <laughs> I'm going to stop now. Yeah, that registering contractors. Oh, well, that was right. Yeah. Nice? Well, as you probably remember, I voted against it. I do remember. That's why I'm saying I'm stopping now. I, you know. <laughs> oh, it's too bad. Let's. Well, <clears throat> it's a, it's a, anyway, it's a big topic. So we'll be interested to see what comes back in 233. No, two, that's 220. 233 is pretty. I mean, sorry, in, in 220. 220. 220 is still sure working. We don't lose that whole bill because of that maybe they would eject that portion and send us the other stuff back or something. No, that they're, my understanding is they're putting it in and it's a, an amendment. Okay. Con they're putting in contractors? No, 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 no. They're putting in the two hours of training every two years. Oh. Yeah. So that's where they are. And I don't know, they haven't really done much around S-124. So I'm hoping that that 
also moves. So what else do we have to do committee? Oh, yeah, you know, that two hours of training, maybe that should be for legislators as well. We need more than that. Uh, on the state energy goals. The problem oh, oh, is on the state. What is, what is the most important training that we can have? Let's see, by implicit bias, civility. Um, let's see, there's a whole list of things. There is. There is, yes. Well. Um, and Vince Luzzi has just sent us another email. Oh. Resending it so that it'll be handy for tomorrow. So in our committee discussion, I guess. Oops. And what was, oh, about the, the language? Yes. Okay. Perhaps you can schedule the pay act as one of the topics you will take testimony as you review the budget impact. Well, I, I, I will write him back. I think we already took testimony on that. We did. That was, he's just sending it all to us again. So we will oh, reread okay. it for tomorrow. So um, the other thing I just wanted to, um, do you want to have a, uh, I got a thing from um, Matt Birmingham um, because there's been some uh, conversation that um, we're having more deaths in Vermont by police officers. It's increasing um, exponentially is the way it was portrayed. And I have a, um, a list of all the um, injuries or deaths by police officers from 1977. If anybody, do you want me to forward that to you? Yeah, that would be interesting given we've all gotten the ACLU emails. Right, right. Sure, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's, um, it lists the, the year, um, the officer involved, the person that was either injured or killed, whether they were injured or killed and what the circumstance was, um, you know, like they were shot and killed during a burglary when they took two hostages, something like that. There's an explanation. So I'll send that to you. But in, in fact, my, my understanding is it's not going up. It's not that big, it's not a large number at all. No, it isn't. It, since 1977, it's um, something like, I think 23 people and, um, and I think two of them were what uh, they refer to as um, suicide by cop. Right. Um, so anyway, I will send that. I will send that to everybody if, if you want that. Right. Yes. Thank you. And thank you. I, so we're on to, to, to tomorrow. You want us to be have thought uh, about BSEA contract and all these budget, what we want to advocate for in the budget. Yeah. And what else? What else we can, um, if we have, we won't have 233, but we can look at what they passed today. So we can right. be ready for that. And, um, and well, let's look at 222 to be ready for that. Does that make sense? Sure. And then I really want to start on this. Um, and I know that it's, uh, Mike was a little bit uh, confused here by what we were actually calling our shelf bill. And he has reworded it a little bit. So it says lessons learned, preparation for potential emergencies bill, as opposed to shelf bill. I think that's an improvement. Thank yes. you. <laughs> it is an improvement. So, um, We'll do. We'll start on those discussions with Tucker and Betsy Ann. Great. Sure. Okay. Okay. Go file your campaign finance report if you haven't already. I haven't. I, I know. My, my treasurer greeted me yesterday as I returned from the post office, walking down her street, and she said, "I filed it yesterday." I'm like, yes. <laughs> um, well, I have nothing to report, so. <laughs> I know. So do you report a, a, a nothing to report bill? Yeah. If, you don't, if you don't go over 500, 
e either raised or spent. I'm just trying to remember the, the baseline. If you don't have carryover from last year. I have $70 carryover from last year. And actually I did get a check for a hundred dollars. So I now have $170. Okay. That's a war chest. It is a war <laughs> chest. Well, for those of us who have a raise, we've raised a little more than that. So we yes. have had so thank you all. See you tomorrow. Yes. Have a lovely afternoon and evening. I'm going off to an, uh, uh, a, a conference on arts and justice. So we'll be channeling our social justice and racial justice issues.